because when we can't see food clearly, right? When we don't know how much we have, we end up buying duplicates of things that we don't need, or we end up not buying that one thing we do need. And the same is true with our money, right? It can often be hidden and out of view. And it's very hard for both people in the couple to see the full picture. This is episode number 489 with Amy Scott. Six questions to ask your partner about finances. Such an important conversation. I can't wait to have with Amy. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Weiner. Welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. And I wrote a book to support anyone who is struggling on their journey to lasting love, or even if you have lasting love, but you are struggling with your own value and your own sense of worth. It's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And it's filled with 30 tips and stories and exercises. They're all designed to help you step more fully into your value. And you can find it on Amazon for Kindle or paperback. This week's tip on becoming a woman of value from the book is step number 19, choose love over fear. Love and fear cannot coexist. One cancels the other out. So we have a choice. If you are living in a place of fear all the time, and I'm sure this will come into play when we talk about money, it is so important to just recognize I'm coming from a place of scarcity, of fear, and I can choose a different perspective. And so I challenge you this week to think about something that you're dealing with right now that you're looking at with scarcity, with fear, with I can't, it's not enough, I'm not enough, and choose to look at it through the lens of love and see what happens. And before I bring Amy on, just a quick shout out to my Facebook group. It's called Your Last First Date. And we have an amazing group of over 3,000 women we are a place to grow. It's, it's a place for a growth mindset. So if you are stuck in dating and relationships and you want to be supported, not just a place to vent and talk about how awful dating is and how awful men are, and you're a single woman over 40, come over here to your last first date. And it's also a place where I do a live video every single week. And there's a lot of great resources in the group. So I encourage you to join us when you're done listening. And now for my guest, Amy Scott, she is a certified financial coach. She teaches couples how to get on the same page about money and why this is such an important thing. She's passionate about helping couples live life with less conflict. Love that. More space to focus on what really matters to them. Amy has spent the last seven years teaching couples to use her unique budgeting system and that gives them confidence, peace of mind, and it allows them per to pursue their dreams that had previously gone unfulfilled. Welcome to the show, Amy. Thank you so much for having me, Sandy. I'm happy to be here. I am so excited to have this conversation. I, the money comes up a lot. And I think, you know, people think, oh, that's not a sexy topic to talk about, <laughs> <laughs> but it actually, it actually is. And I think that we... We don't realize the money stories that we have. And before we record, I was just telling you one of mine. <laughs> I struggled with paying $30 to, to pay for a suitcase when I never had to pay for it before. And it's like, where did that come from? You know, it's $30. Like I would spend that at the grocery store without thinking. Mm -hmm. So I would love to know a little bit more about you and what led you to this career in finance and budgeting. Well, it was not a direct path. I'll put it that way. Definitely my background is really in public health. I'd studied that for years, worked in public health, women's health. And then it wasn't until my husband, Mick, and I had some you know, financial challenges that I started to get interested in personal finances. So for us, it was when we had two boys who were seemingly born back to back. At least that's how it felt to me. There was one and then the other one was there. They were both under the age of two. And I was given about six weeks off from work, Sandy. And at the time I was feeling just a lot of anxiety about going back 
I felt like I wasn't ready for that yet. Like I wanted to have a little more time at home before I jumped back into the work pool. And I remember having some like stress around that, like, oh, is that fair to my husband? Is that fair to me? Is that going to work for us? And I remember going to him and talking to him about it and him saying, oh, well, you know, we're doing well enough financially. We should be able to, you know, give you that option to take some more time off and be with the boys before you go back. But when we dug into our income and our expenses, we realized that we were not making enough for my husband's high school teacher salary for me to be able to stay at home. And I shared that because that was really a pivotal moment. And I remember thinking, what could we have done differently that would have allowed this to be an option for us? Felt like this option was like yanked off the table. And what conversations could we have had? What could we have done differently with our money that would have made it okay? But I'm not the kind of person who takes no easily. So I remember thinking like, all right, well, what can we do to make this possible? And when we dug deeper and started to analyze what we were spending money on and to see if, you know, we talk about, does that align with our values, but also really looking at like, is this something we could put pause on for this season of our life? Is this something we could go without for three to six months, for example? What we realized was the gap was a lot smaller than we thought. We really only needed at that time about $600 more in addition to my husband's income for me to be able to stay at home. And as soon as we had that number, as soon as we had that clarity, which we just, you know, we've been married several years, but we never really had that clarity around our finances. And once we had that, it was like game on, you know, it brought us together because now it was like we were operating around the same goal. Like, okay, how do we bridge that gap month to month? And what realized, what happened was we started making a lot more money than that off of odd jobs. My husband took on some SAT monitoring, some tutoring. He was given a new teaching job. And all of a sudden I realized, wow, I actually really like this. I like the budgeting piece. I like the numbers piece. How do I not really realize this before? And friends would ask, how are you guys doing that? You know, did you need to take on a personal loan? Did you get like a home equity loan? And I'd say, No, but the boys nap between 12 and two. If you come on over to our kitchen table, I'll talk to you about what we're doing around our finances. And that's really where my business was born in those conversations. I love it. It's usually some some crisis leads us to (laughs) our careers, right? Yeah. And, you know, so much has come up for me as you're talking. I um I was never taught how to manage money. And most of us, I don't think are. I've actually tried to help my children because Mm -hmm. when I got divorced, I had no job. I was in the middle of coaching certification. So I was in the middle of changing careers. I had the ability and the talent to do a few things, but in that gap, I had to rely on my divorce settlement. I had to make sure I, I invested my money and that I budgeted well to be able to live in the house that I had just purchased, which freaked me out. <laughs> wow. So I, I did sit my kids down, especially as they got older and said, you know, it's important for you to look at your money and to be realistic about what you have and what you don't have and how to grow your money. And yeah. some of them listened, some of them did not. <laughs> Um, but I, the child that I'm actually going to visit today, um, as we're speaking, I'm about to fly out to California to visit my youngest daughter and she's got a good job, but it's hard for her to budget. And I'm hoping that one of the things we do while I'm out there is to look at what she's spending and cause she overspends, she, you know, it's the little things, a lot of times, mm-hmm. you know, she, she loves to go thrifting. And then it's only $10 and this is only, it's just such a great deal. She got her nails done at, you know, these acrylic art, arty kind of thing that she got done. She was so excited and she calls me and said, you know, it was so cheap. It was only $90 mom. And I'm like, my reaction was the same (laughs) as what your face looks like right now. And I'm like, okay, you were just complaining about not having enough money and you need to budget and you just spent $90 on your nails. Mm. I didn't want to share it with you because I knew you would judge me. And I'm like, you know, you're telling me 90 is cheap. I don't care if you want to get your nails done, but let's get realistic here. $90 is not cheap 
for your nails, right? So <laughs> what would you suggest? I mean, I know we're talking about couples and money, but this is a relationship. And I think that there are a lot of people with children who overspend or they overspend or they don't realize what they could do. Um, so is there something I can share with my daughter <laughs> as I go out there? Because she, she has asked for support. I wouldn't just impose it. <laughs> what where would you suggest that I start with her in terms of having a budget and really looking at her money realistically? Well, I think in practical terms, like a couple of things for that relationship in particular, I think a lot of times we think there are things we should or we shouldn't do around money. So even though my reaction to $90 on nails, <laughs> right? Somebody else's reaction might be like, oh, wow, that was actually really good. Cause you know, it's 160 here or something like that. It's right. often like when I work with couples sometimes and I'll say, well, how much is in you know, your bank account? And they'll say, oh, wow, there's $5,000 in there. And one person in the couple says, woohoo, there's $5,000 in there. And the other person has a look of, oh my gosh, I can't believe there's only $5,000 in there, right? Like those different perceptions. So the piece around that is, at least with your daughter in this conversation is, there's nothing, at least that I believe that she should be doing around her finances. And I think that's the piece as parents, my kids are still you know, younger, they're not on their own, they're 11 and 13, but that whole idea of shooting on ourselves around money, mm -hmm. like, well, I should be spending less. I should be saving more. I should be less in debt, something like that. I like to say that the should will not carry the day. So my encouragement will be to come from a conversation of what is that that you want that would be a strong enough why, because should will never be a strong enough why that would have you take steps around budgeting. So it could be with your daughter that maybe she just hasn't really identified that, okay, here are the steps towards budgeting and this is what it's gonna provide for me in the future. That why for her maybe just isn't strong enough. And I don't know. I mean, I have a mom, she's 79 today, um, <laughs> but I remember her talking to me about money growing up. And you know, if it came from a place of a should, it didn't necessarily have the same impact as being curious. So what I would recommend Sandy in that conversation is, I always say, start with curiosity. Don't get into the numbers. Don't get into the budgeting piece. There's all different things she could do online around that, but have a conversation where you're curious, where you're asking questions of, well, where do you, not necessarily the big, like, where do you want to be in a year from now or something like that, but like, what's something that's important to you that you'd like to see that you've accomplished in a couple of years, for example. And then here's the key listen, which I'm sure you are excellent at given your profession, <laughs> but listen, and this is true for couples as well, but listen without judgment or criticism. Yeah. If you can bring that curiosity, maybe she just hasn't made that connection yet to the choices she's making today and the impact they may have on the things that she wants, maybe not 30, 40 years down the road, but a year to two to five years down the road. If someone had had that conversation with me, it would have made a really big difference, at least, you know, at that time in my life. Yeah, those are great, great points. And, and, and I mean, it's really what I do in coaching. So it, it's like you, you can lose track when it's your own kid or yeah. your spouse or whatever it is, but um, curiosity is key. And to keep being curious, you know, like I like to say, it's like you're coming from another planet. Like you don't know anything about this person. And because we have such preconceived notions about the people in our lives, like, oh, yes. this is how they're going to respond. So I need to say this. And right. Yeah. So I love that. I love the curiosity and I love the why we're not motivated by should. We're motivated by our values and our why. Mm -hmm. And uh, like my son just moved to his apartment after he uh, quit his job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. I actually think it was a good idea because if he was waiting to have enough money to, you know, just to be in the perfect place, it's just like anything else. Like we sometimes need to jump and then the jumping gives us the impetus to fill that bucket of, you know, getting the finances together. 
now he's motivated. He's got his why. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. 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 And that piece just may be what she hasn't explored yet fully. Yeah. I think what she's feeling now is I have expenses. She's mm -hmm. living in LA in an expensive apartment. I mean, a pretty good deal, but a good, but expense. It's a lot of expenses and eating sure. out and, and she had dental work done and she had to pay for it. <laughs> it's like, Oh, that was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so then you start feeling that, Oh my God, I have very little in the bank and that can be scary to people. Sure. So if for her, it's more of I've had expenses and I'm seeing my, my accounts dwindling and I don't like it. You know, mm -hmm. she liked it when she was living with me during the pandemic and the money was piling up and she was like, whoa, I got <laughs> Love <that>. money, right. <laughs> so, and I do charge my kids rent when they live here, by the way. Um, nice. I think Good it's lesson. important. To, yeah. Think, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And splitting food bills and stuff like that, just to feel the responsibility of you living here and you got to contribute. Sure. Um, so let's talk about relationships, marital stress around money. Why is money such a trigger for stress? I think one of the reasons is that we come into relationships, whether that is a beginning of a relationship, whether that's a marriage, for example, but anytime a relationship starts to get serious, we start to explore and realize that we have different beliefs, expectations, and experiences around money. So for example, one person inside of a couple might um, have always used credit cards, for example. They love to get the points. They love to get the cash back. That's how they manage their money. And then the other person in the relationship says, well, no, like I've always used cash. That's how my parents did it. That's really worked for me. And then that can cause a conflict inside of a relationship because of those different experiences and beliefs. Or you might have two people who you know, come together and they start to share their finances and one person is completely committed to paying off their debt, for example. Maybe they have a bunch of student loans and they've been on this path to pay down those student loans. Whereas the other person says, well, no, I'm not so worried about the student loans or debt. I wanna make sure we're maxing out our retirement, for example. And that can cause a certain amount of conflict inside of a relationship. You can also have where one person in the relationship loves budgeting, loves spreadsheets, loves to have their head in the bank account, moving around the numbers. And the other person would rather talk about pretty much anything else underneath the sun than about money and isn't really even interested in opening up their bank account, just says, well, it'll work itself out. And that can cause a certain amount of conflict, right? Um, the other thing is often if two people are sharing finances, one person in the relationship is often focused on the regular monthly bills. So I'm not here to say that that needs to be 50-50, doesn't all need to be shared. However, there usually is one person who's managing and paying you know, the mortgage, the Verizon pill, the car payment, whatever. And the other person may not really be part of paying those bills, but they're still spending money. Both people are spending money in the day-to-day, -day, right? They're doing the groceries. And even the person not managing the day-to-day -day bills sometimes is the person who spends more in the day-to-day. -day. They may be the parent who picks up the kids and gets pizza after soccer practice or deals with you know, school fees or something like that. So both people have their own experience, their own vision. I often like to say it's like um, they're both watching their own movie, uh, their own version of a movie. They're in two different theaters inside of the movie theater and they're watching it. And if they talk about it, they see things for their, from their own perspective, but they have a really hard time seeing the big picture, right? Seeing how one decision impacts the other decisions along the road. So the one person who's managing the monthly bills, it's not really the big bills that cause the conflict. It's more, all right, I have an idea. We've laid out our budget. We're good for this month. We're going to put this amount towards savings, this amount towards debt. And then the other spouse goes on an extra grocery run. And that is a piece where it's like, well, why did you do that? Why did you need to do that? We didn't need more you know, groceries. We could have, and that's the piece that brings things to a head. Um, I also think another reason that finances can be challenging inside of a relationship is because it's very hard in today's day and age to see what's happening full picture with our money. 
it's kind of like, I like to give this example. If you, um, if you're going grocery shopping and you come back and you're putting the uh, groceries away in the fridge or in the pantry and you go to put away, let's say you bought two cans of black beans and you realize you already have four cans of black beans in the cupboard. That ever happened? <laughs> Maybe. <Yeah. laughs> or in my house, it's like nuts. I feel like we always have a billion bags of nuts in our house, right? But when, you know, or if we go to make a special dinner, maybe for our sweetheart or for our spouse, and we go to make it and we realize we have all the ingredients except for the one thing that makes it a special dinner, right? We were sure we had it in the back of the fridge. And I give that as an example, because when we can't see food clearly, right? When we don't know how much we have, we end up buying duplicates of things that we don't need or we end up not buying that one thing we do need. And the same is true with our money, right? It can often be hidden and out of view. And it's very hard for both people in the couple to see the full picture. I, I gave up a lot of the money power to my husband. Mm-hmm. And for a while I was managing the bills and then he took over the bills and I didn't know how much we had. I, I didn't know. And, and there was a, a point where we were splitting a gift it was a monetary gift of a building that we had to sell in the process of divorce. And he wanted to give me like, I don't know, a 10th of the value of the building. <laughs> and I was like, uh uh-huh, that ain't happening. Um, it, so, you know, divorce is, a, it's, it's a dis- dissolution of not only the emotional and the, the, you know, all the stuff that comes with marriage, but it's a business that you're dissolving. And so I always tell people, find out what your money is now while you're married. Mm -hmm. And I have a daughter who's married and, um, and I told her you need to, it's another should, but I I think it's really beneficial for you to (laughs) understand your finances because there was a point where her husband was spending money that she was very unconscious about, and it got them into trouble. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, if you want to change that, you need to have these money conversations, which brings us to the six questions that people should ask their partner to understand how they think about money. So what are those questions? Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices, your smartphone, your tablet, your PC or Mac, Fire TV, and any Alexa-enabled devices like the Amazon Echo. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. I think one of the beginning questions, and I think you can ask this maybe not on a first date, although you could ask it on a first date or you could ask it after you've been married 15 years and you, and you want to get deeper into that conversation. I just want to say, Sandy, that I think it's really important to start with these questions. Listen, I'm a money nerd at the end of the day. So it's very hard for me not to jump into and be like, well, your daughter should do this. And this is how she should be in this, but you know, (laughs) but I have found that when I come at that and folks haven't asked these questions with curiosity, with that, you know, listening without judgment, exactly how you were describing that before that it doesn't carry the day, the, the actions, they change around their finances don't produce the results they want because they haven't gone deep around these questions. Right. So, you know, there are several ones, but I like to ask, I like to ask my clients to ask what messages did you hear about money growing up? To start with that, what messages, and sometimes, honestly, just asking that question, people will think, well, what do you mean? What were the messages? But then if you start to say, well, how did your parents deal with money? Right? Was, was there ever any a time where you worried about money as a family? There's a whole thread you could go down around that, but I feel like that's a, a really good beginning question to start to get an understanding of how you may not have gotten similar messages or seeing your parents manage money in similar ways growing up. And that, that could impact how you deal with money right now. So that would be the first one. Yeah, that's a great question. And when I think about my daughter, 
I grew up with a lot of, we can't afford, you mm-hmm. know, we can't afford this. And so money was looked at with scarcity. And I'm sure I passed that on to her. Sure. And her husband grew up with, let's just spend money, mm-hmm. even though they, they weren't necessarily wealthy. And so that's an important thing to, to also point out that it's not necessarily a reflection of how much you have. It's mm-hmm. the message, the perspective. Um, because we all walk away with messages and we're not even conscious of them a lot of the time. Yeah. 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 So it's, you know, you can really learn something about, you know, your partner in that conversation, but probably you'll learn more about yourself than you anticipated, or even more than you learn about your partner as you start to explore into that. Yeah. Um, I also have folks ask, what does, mean, what does having money mean to you? Does that mean security? Does that mean freedom? What does it really mean to you to have money? And then enter into that conversation. Um, so those are the values, those are the why questions like why do you want money what does money mean yeah yeah Yeah. what what would that provide for you or what would that provide for us having Mm -hmm. money because again Mm -hmm. you know we can go down that tunnel of the should but if we can understand you know sometimes i'll have um couples that i work with and one person say well we're just he just wants to put so much towards retirement. It's always about the future. It's always about, you know, but if you can explore, well, what does that mean to you? Oh, actually that makes me feel secure. That makes me feel like I can do this around my job and maybe take this leap around my business or something like that. If we can start to understand that piece with our spouse or our partner, those things that we do that we think, why do they do that? Become a lot more palatable, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, so then uh, along those lines, what is having, what is it being good with money? Like, oh, well, we're doing well with money. What does that mean to you? Like, what would that look like to be doing well with money? Would it be having an emergency fund? Would it be going on annual vacations? Does that mean staying out of debt? Because again, those perceptions and perspectives of one person, oh, well, if we don't have any debt, then we're going to be doing well. Whereas the other person, that's not even, in, they're fine. They will tolerate that debt. It doesn't have anything to do with the equation for them. So having a conversation of what will that mean to you if we're doing well with money? What does that look like in the day-to-day? Um, yeah, I, I love that. I actually dated somebody who was in debt, a lot of debt. And it made me very uncomfortable because he wasn't paying it down. Yeah. And I said, I understand why you went into debt. Totally not judging that. Mm -hmm. I said, but are you working to get out of debt? And he said, yes. And then nothing happened. And so after a few months, I I brought it up again because it made me really feel unsafe in the relationship Mm -hmm. that he was happy having debt, credit card debt at that, which is like, such high interest. And he was also buying things and planning things for the future with me and showing me this beautiful jacket he bought for $200. And I was like, "Ah, I don't feel (laughs) safe here. (laughs) Yeah. So that was one of the reasons that I couldn't be with him because his irresponsibility around money or the way I saw it Mm -hmm. did not make me feel good about his decision-making. Yeah. And I think it's really good to trust that that's, that's a red flag for you. Yes. Whereas for someone else, it may not be. Exactly. Well, for him, it wasn't (laughs) for him. It certainly wasn't. I'm not sure how easy it's going to be for him to find someone that's not a red flag for me. (laughs) (laughs) So good luck to him. We hope that worked out. Exactly. (laughs) But I, I think there's something to be said for the way that you framed that you know, and maybe at the time you were able to express that, maybe you weren't, but the way that you framed no, I said that, it well, exactly like that. I love I that. I love that. Thank you, you know, um, so, um, another thing I have folks ask is, is there anything that you, and this is more maybe for married couples or if you're sharing finances, but is there anything that you wish that we could do or have, but you don't bother bringing it up because you're afraid we're never going to have the money to be able to do it? 
and a tag onto that is because you're afraid of what my reaction may be to bringing that up. This probably brings the most conversations to the table with the folks that I work with, because typically there is something, if not several things, and it may be a, oh, I'd love if we had a treadmill, for example, but it's often the experiences folks have that they're like, oh, well, someday we'll get there. When we have this amount of money, we've saved this amount, or maybe he or she will feel more comfortable once we're more stable, for example, but they don't voice those things that they want to have or want to do or want to experience right now. Even if that's a, gosh, in the back of my mind, I'm so scared, but I'm going to bring it to the table. I'd really like someday to be able to start my own business you know, or to cut back on my work hours or to have more time to be able to paint, for example, bringing that to the surface in these conversations allows for, okay, I didn't know that was so important to you. Can we shift our plan? Is there anything that we can do now to be able to make that as an option for you? Because to me, it's really not about having more money. It's about having more options. So what shifts can we make today so that we don't turn around I'm thinking about your daughters, right? That, you know, <laughs> that we don't turn around and say, you know, if I had said that, maybe this would be an option for us. That's the piece I'm really interested in is, you know, you may or may not decide to start that business or to take that vacation or to move close to your parents or whatever, but let's get it voiced as something that you want to have an option in the future. And let's create your plan such that you'll be able to say yes to that when the time comes. I love that. I think that one of my whys with spending money is watching how my father would always plan for the would have, should have, could have in his life. And so he got to be too frail to travel as much as he wanted to. He had the money. He just always put things off to someday. And I am a big believer in someday it's today. If you can do it, don't put it off. If you can't do it, plan for it and make it happen. And just knowing like going out to California to see my daughter or my other daughter lives in Israel. When I first got divorced, I didn't have money saved up for big trips because I was not making money yet. And sure. so what I found out was like, okay, so how can I, get to visit my daughter and her daughter. And I discovered that I had a lot of airline miles that had expired during my marriage and I got them back. I, I yeah. worked hard to get them back and got the right credit card and started spending money on that card. And the day that I was able to finally have enough points to go was huge because that was a priority. That was my why. And so a lot of people say, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't. And I think there are many ways to rethink money. So I wanted to put that out there, but I also want to say that I've seen people make money so emotional and not be able to separate the emotions from the fact that it's just money. It really doesn't have anything attached unless we attach it. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you have, have any advice. I know we're still in the middle of our six yeah, questions, fine. but yeah, sure. just that whole emotional piece around what money means to people. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for people who are so emotionally attached to what money means? Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot of times we don't know that we're emotionally attached, right? We haven't even identified that that's just how it is with money. That's just our experience. We haven't pulled back the layer to see, well, why is that there? So I guess the first piece I would say is just, you know, recognize that we don't all have the same experience. And I think once you're in a relationship and you see how someone else maybe deals with money, even if it's friends, right? Or even if it's colleagues or, you know, um, people that are in your life and you see they're dealing with it differently and maybe they aren't having that same anxiety. Maybe they're not having that same worry, that same kind of stress. To me, that's a bit of a, I don't want to say red flag, but it's a bit of an aha. Wow. There's a different way to feel and experience money, you know, and that's the piece. It doesn't have to be the way that it is for me. So kind of starting from there and um, digging in for yourself to 
well, what in, and, you know, pulling out a journal is probably what I would recommend if you're not going to work with a coach or a therapist, but kind of just track some of that, like this happened and separating what happened from the emotions and the story that we're making about it. I think that's the biggest piece because if someone else looks at it and says, well, you know, to use your example for you paying the $30 for that second bag, (laughs) right. Kind of just, wow, I was told I had to pay this $30. That's what happened. And yet over here, I had a reaction to that. And what is it I said about that? that had me go down this tunnel, you know, not like a tunnel necessarily, but have this stressful reaction to it. Mm -hmm. What is the story that I said about that? And as much as possible to separate what happened from the story that we told about it. Yeah. The stories we make up are incredible. I I have a client who um, was working on renovating her home Mm -hmm. and she's a designer. So For her to renovate her home was like having the shoemaker have nice shoes and she put it off for a very long time and she really, really wanted to do it, but she really was afraid to spend the money. And she was afraid that her husband would nix a lot of her ideas. And Mm -hmm. so she was hesitating about bringing up a lot of things. And so that, you know, the things that you wish you could have done or did have and being afraid to talk about it. Yeah. Every time she's had these conversations with him, he's been supportive. It, it's always <laughs> her own money story. And right. so when you can start to unravel, and yes, he has fears around money too. Sure. And he's got to deal with his own money fears and money issues and you know, in the relationship. But when you start taking on the emotions of your partner and being afraid to talk about something because you're afraid of something that might happen, but it may also not happen. That's where you start to, you know, avoid the conversations that you really need to have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So 100%. let's go to number five. What is the fifth okay. question? That's good. You're keeping track of those numbers. Good job. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, and again, the con- just reminding all of us of the context for all this isn't pulling out this sheet and going through these questions to like get them done. It's being in this curious space. It's asking these questions. And I love that example of your client because the purpose of all these questions is just to learn things that we didn't know. To confront, for lack of a better word, those stories that we have made up those perceptions we have about our spouses or our partners. So um, I like to have uh, my clients ask, what's your number one worry when it comes to money? So what keeps you up at night? And again, often what we think that is, is very different for the other person. And then if we see what that is, and it's something that we could actually deal with, like, oh, well, wouldn't take, I, I didn't realize for you not having X amount in emergency fund was causing you stress and worry and keeping you up at night. Let's prioritize getting that complete so that you feel safer, and more secure, secure around money, for example. Or, you know, sometimes we hear, oh, well, I just want to be able to put money towards college for the kids. Okay. Yeah, we'll get there. But if you realize that that for your partner is the number one stress for them is causing them stress or worry or thinking, I'm not going to be able to visit my daughter next year. We don't have a plan for that in place yet. Again, if you're able to express that, your partner can't read your mind. But if you're able to share that, then if the two of you are planning together and taking the action steps around your money, then you can plan for having that worry be eradicated. Yeah, I mean, as you're talking, these are all about our own personal values, Mm -hmm. sharing what is important to us, what our needs are, being heard, being validated. And it doesn't mean that you're always going to be completely in agreement, but when you understand where the other person's coming from, because you don't, unless you get curious, Mm -hmm. then you can empathize with what their needs are and they can understand what your needs are. And I think it builds compassion and Mm -hmm. it builds more understanding and more love, which is really the goal here, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I love that. It does. It builds compassion for what that person's experience is. There are still things, you know, my husband and I've been married 15 years now, and there are still things that I'll say that he'll think, 
where did that come from? I didn't know that your parents did that. I very much grew up with a saver and my mom, her family grew up with very little money. They worked what, how they needed, they, they did whatever they had to do to be able to get by. And my dad grew up with quite a bit of money and didn't think about it in the same way. So I had these parents. And of course I, as a kid, didn't understand spender versus saver, but I did see how they acted differently around money. So when I go to, you know, put the thermostat down to 63 degrees and my husband says, what are you doing? And I'll say, gosh, it's just like, I don't even remember my mom ever putting it above 62, you know, 63 <laughs> feels high in this house to me. But just when I stop for a moment, he'll say, yeah, that's, that's, that's you. Now he doesn't right. say, sometimes he'll joke and say, well, that's not normal, but you know, but he'll say like, <laughs> that's you. What, what is it that happened in the past that had you decide that that piece of compassion, that muscle is built between the two of us. And that's the piece I think is so important. Mm. We're not going to get all this right. There are going right. to be things that we do, you know, quote unquote, wrong around money, bad choices that we make, things we turn later and say, oh, I wish we hadn't spent money on that. But if we can build this compassion muscle, then whatever happens, we'll have space for it, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's a great example. I think that when you said that's you, I was thinking, is it really you or is it just your programming? And yes. we're unconscious so much about why we do what we do. You know, and I, I remember my daughter saying, you know, so you're so cheap. And I said, okay, let's have a conversation about that. You know, am I cheap or am I frugal? And I watch the money so that I'll have money mm -hmm. to pay my mortgage and to go on vacations and to, so it's, it's reframing because she saw it as cheap. I mm -hmm. didn't see it as cheap. Um, I saw it as being smart with money. And, and again, it's like, it's the stories we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. That's her interpretation. And that's yeah. great. And I, and I bet that did lead to when you shared more with her compassion, even in your relationship. Yeah. And appreciation now for the fact that I was able to save money and was able to be yeah. responsible. And it's, you know, we're modeling all the time for everybody in our lives. And I think we just need to be in integrity with how we feel about money and everything else so that people can see who we really are and we can see who they really are. Yeah. So let's get to number six. All right. Well, we'll finish it out with a bang, something a little okay. more exciting. Uh, <laughs> I feel like people maybe hear this question in different ways in life, but um, I encourage folks to ask if you received $50,000 unexpectedly, what would you want to do with it? And that is a great date night conversation. You know, people say, how do we have these conversations? Yeah, I don't care. Driving the kids to soccer or you're sitting with each other in traffic somewhere. It doesn't really matter. Can be in passing. But this is a really nice conversation to have over a date night with each other because there will be things that either one of you wants to spend that money on that you didn't necessarily anticipate. And I find that that question really leads to a greater understanding and an excitement about the future because it, we don't have to wait for that $50,000 to land in our laps unexpectedly. We start to see things that are important to us and say, well, let's not wait for that. Let's start to take steps to make that a reality for us now. I love that question. I, it actually, there was something in, um, there's, there were 36 questions that if you ask a person, it can make anybody fall in love with you. It was, it was a big New York Times article and it became a TED talk. And I think one of them had to do with something like this mm -hmm. because these were all ways to go deeper with people and really understand their why. Mm -hmm. And so it's such a great question. And it also brings to mind a lot of times people are waiting for to be in a relationship, for example, in order to start really having experiences that they would do with a couple as a mm. couple. Sure. And I always encourage people to do those things now. So it's, it's like, if you, you don't put your life on hold waiting for some special moment in time, we've discussed that many times in this conversation. And I think when we look at money, you know, there won't be this magical day where the money falls out of the sky and you, unless you win the lottery and those people usually end up losing all their money anyway. So, you know, it's like, what would you do? And let's, let's have these experiences. Let's give ourselves what brings us joy and, 
you know, and for, for a lot of people, it, it really is about the experience. It's not about the fancy car or the, you know, the, the expensive designer clothing. It's being able to have experiences that, that will build memories that will be amazing to also build the couple. And yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, this, what I love about this conversation is that it's really about curiosity and compassion at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And what we really need in all of our relationships is more of both of those things. I think no matter what we're doing and how we're coming at it, if you could add more curiosity and compassion, it will improve all of your relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's, you know, that really is the foundation of, I think any kind of coaching is to help people to build that curiosity, build that compassion about ourselves and about our partners for sure. You know, then you can get into the practical how to but that is the foundation of all of those conversations so that they will have the lasting impacts that you're really committed to. Yeah, for sure. Well, this is such an important conversation. And I know that you have a resource that um, people can use to have more clarity and harmony around their finances. Can you share that with us? For sure. It's, uh, it's a resource that I've created. It's called Three Steps to Uplevel Your Budget, but it really ties in these six questions and then how to have those as the foundation and then practical steps to take to get you and your partner on the same page about money. And anybody can find that it's on my website, which is really easy, amyscottcoaching.com. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Amy, for coming on the show, for, for sharing this really beautiful way of looking at the money conversation. It takes all the icky pressure shoulds and the, <laughs> yes. all the negativity that people put around money. And it just makes it such a beautiful conversation, which will bring people closer, which is really the goal here on our podcast. So thank you. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. And thanks everybody for listening. If you love our show, please, please rate and review and subscribe um, on Apple podcasts. It really helps our show continue to grow. And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. That's lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. I look forward to talking to you soon.